the program on decolonizing history is about sort of questioning which people and places are at the center of the study of the past and why. And it's offering us a, a critical lens through which we can look and ask questions about what are the effects of centering some histories and marginalizing other histories? Um, how has history been used to reproduce and challenge inequalities? And we're very happy today to present a, an international panel of scholars who we were joking before you all arrived are basically covering the history of every continent. So we're very ambitious tonight um, in, our, in our program on decolonizing anti-colonial nationalism. I've put this together with my colleague, Dr. Andrew Liu, who is going to serve as, he's gonna introduce our speakers tonight and then we will get started. We, are, we plan to probably sort of engage as panelists for somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes and then leave plenty of time at the end for discussion. I do encourage you again, as questions arise tonight, just pop them into the Q&A, which we're gonna be watching. We're not gonna be kind of monitoring the chat, so make sure that you use that Q&A function, which is on the bottom right-hand side of your um, screen. So, Andy. Yes, thanks. Uh, thanks, Elizabeth, for the introduction, and thanks, everyone, for attending during um, you know, uh, a time that is a very inconvenience for everyone. Um, so the, to go, to be a little bit more specific about kind of the themes or the thought process behind tonight's talk, um, you know, we, the, the, this year is de dedicated to this theme of decolonizing history. And as we've talked about um, in a lot of the previous talks, this general idea of decolonization has seemed to take on a life, not a life of its own, like sort of, uh, it's, it's kind of become a very uh, popular topic of discussion in academia, but also in popular movements outside of academia. And um, the idea of what decolonization is, is kind of open-ended, right? It's up for discussion. It kind of means different things to different people. I think one thing that it largely does kind of, um, kind of gravitate towards though is a critique of some sort of Eurocentrism, right? however that gets defined. Um, and this gets, it takes on many different forms, many different categories, like the West is one, the global North, the first world, white supremacy and so on. So I was, you know, what we're thinking for this panel and this month is to kind of broaden, uh, broaden the discussion because in addition to the political and the moral dimension of decolonization, there's a historical dimension, right? That the idea of uh, anti-colonial decolonizing um, political and, and, and intellectual processes, it has a long history, it has a long career. And it's not just a one or two parts of the world, it's most of the world, right? Because imperialism was global. So the things that we wanted to discuss today was to just kind of um, explore what is the history, what is the career of decolonization historically? in many different parts of the world. And maybe we can learn, I know I will learn a lot a bit beyond my particular part of what I study, just through a comparison with um, the, other, the other sort of uh, continents and countries and examples we're gonna discuss, right? So we're gonna talk tonight about the Americas, Asia, Africa, and pro probably also parts of Europe and the United States. Um, and, and again, the goal is, you know, if we, all, if we want to be faithful to this idea of overcoming Eurocentrism, it would be useful to look at the history of decolonization beyond, right, the, the North Atlantic. So I will be speaking last. The first two speakers, uh, let me briefly introduce them. The first speaker will be Jamil Aydin, who is a professor of international and global history at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and he can, I guess he can explain further, like what is his specialization, but he's very, uh, uh, what's the word, versatile, being able to talk about a lot of uh, different parts of Central Asia or Eastern Asia and the history of decolonization or anti-Western thought in those parts of the world. Um, and uh, the second speaker will be Professor Stella Krepp, Assistant Professor of Latin America and Iberian History at Bern University in Switzerland. She will be talking about uh, general, the, I don't know, anti-imperial, anti-colonial uh, political movements and, or political sentiments in Latin America. Um, I think particularly in the Cold War, right? Um, and then I, I'm a specialist on modern China. This is, I'm going to be kind of jumping in with sort of what is happening in Chinese history, kind of tagging along with the different events um, of the other two speakers. But the last thing is, you know, in the question and answer section, but pr also throughout the talk, you know, we want to make sure that this is relevant, right? That this, we always kind of bring this historical topics um, to life and talk about their relevance to the contemporary world and maybe make comparisons with the modern world. So that's something that I hope we can achieve as well 
um, if not in the talks, then in the question and answer session. So the first speaker will be um, Jamil Aydin. Um, thank you, Andrew and Elizabeth, and thank you to Villanova University for, uh, and the Center for hosting us for this interesting conversation. Um, I, um, uh, I will just share a couple, a couple of pictures, and then um, while I'm talking, maybe let me share that with you. Um, so I uh, want to note, I guess I can, um, um, I can hide this. Um, I want to note that um, I previously wrote a book on uh, politics of anti-Westernism in Asia. Um, and I use the word anti-Westernism uh, rather than decolonization. Uh, and this was a book on Pan-Asianism of, of Japan, as well as uh, Pan-Islamic foreign policy of Turkey. And um, the book was actually in the content was arguing that uh, neither Japan nor the Ottoman Empire or Turkey were anti-Western. So the title was to attract attention. And after September 11, um, in the content, the argument was that these two uh, empires, non-European empires, were actually trying to be part of the Eurocentric imperial club, imperial order. Uh, they were racialized and pushed away. And then as a response, these two uh, medium-sized powers um, try to use anti-colonial, instrumentalize anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism and decolonization for their own um, interest. And I want to relate this book to kind of historiography and, and the discussion you had last week in the series uh, with uh, Professor Geta Chu, uh, her, her book on Pan-Africanism and world making after empire. When we talk about Japan and the Ottoman Empire, um, we are talking about empires that existed during World War I and World War II, and that also uh, made alliance with Germany uh, as part of um, imperial competition that, to preserve the empire. There is some sort of difference between these two powers, Turkey and Japan, in terms of their relationship with the international order compared to the post-colonial African states that uh, Professor Gattachu talked about last week, is that post-colonial African states, they were, while becoming independent, they wanted to remake the world order to make it less racist, less discriminatory, more equal. Um, and so they made a connection between their independence and, um, and re restructuring the world. Um, and, and it seems like the first part they succeeded and the second part they failed. So uh, her book is actually telling us roots of the problem that we still face today, that we have a post-colonial world of nation states, um, but we do not have uh, the desired equality envisioned by these um, nationalist leaders. When we get to the topic of, of Japan and Turkey and their um, strategy of decolonization, we have some sort of controversies that um, the Ottoman Empire um, uh, in World War I use some sort of anti-colonial jihad once they decide to join the war against Britain, France, and, um, and allied powers, Russia. Um, and Japan did something very similar. They use uh, almost the language of colored race jihad against the white race when they started the war um, from, uh, uh, from 1940 onwards, after, especially after Pearl Harbor. And they, the language seems very idealistic. Um, but we do know, of course, that these empires were not very idealistic, that they, uh, they did these wars in order to preserve an empire, especially in the case of Japan. Um, Japan's occupation of China and Korea was revealing, showing the hypocrisy of that, um, of that call for jihad. Therefore, I need to know, note that when I picked that topic in late 1990s, um, um, as a research topic, my advisor uh, who was a Japanese American who came from Japan, uh, discouraged me from working on this. He said, there's nothing much to work on uh, Japanese Pan-Asianism. Um, it was a cover for Japan's own colonialism. It was all a lie. Um, in, even though he himself wrote something similar to what I was trying to say in 1960s, and he was blamed as being an apologist for Japanese imperialism. Um, and I was trying to do, I, I, I agree with him in, in that regard. I was trying to do something different. I was trying to look at actually how um, people in East Asia, in the Middle East and Africa, they talk to each other, um, what kind of ideas they exchange in, um, 
in, in what I called in their anti-racist globalism. It's a kind of intellectual project, intellectual decolonization. Um, in that context, I want to um, note my appreciation and thanks to a Villanova professor, Professor Mark Galicio, whose talk on African-American intellectuals in Japan, I attended at Tokyo University campus at Komaba. Um, and it was very uh, big inspiration. I was uh, just doing my research, but to, but to see, um, and it turned this into a book later on, uh, to see how African-American intellectuals saw their solidarity with the yellow rays and, and Japan. And that's exactly the conversation I wanted to have because pan-nationalism of, of pan-Islam, pan-Asia, pan-Africa emerged around the same time, 1880s, um, evolved around along similar lines as a foundational discourse of rights uh, that all of these three um, pan-national uh, uh, ideologies or discourses or projects were trying to reject the white supremacy in the narratives of history, in the social sciences, they were planning to reject um, um, the hierarchies of race that they were subjected to. Um, and in some sense, they won, right? They succeeded in actually rewriting history in, in, in a big sense to make sure that everybody believes that, that there, there's a racial equality. Human beings are not uh, hierarchically structured in, in that regard. I think at that part, um, there, there are a lot of commonalities between Pan-Africanism, Pan-Asianism, and Pan-Islamism. But there's also a part that they diverge. Um, they diverge in terms of you know, who uses these ideas, when, and for what purpose. Uh, and the divergence uh, can be seen in the case of uh, how the Ottomans, uh, once they joined the war, used the, the, the Pan-Islamic Jihad against Britain, especially against Britain's claim to be the greatest Muslim empire in the world, which was true that Britain in uh, 19, um, well, until 1947, had the largest number of Muslim populations under their rule. In fact, they always claimed to be the greatest Muslim empire in the world. And um, so the question that, that we, we ask is that, how are, how, did they ever contribute to decolonization? What did they do? And what we see in, in Japan and the Ottoman Empire is that the answer is yes and no at the same time. Meaning that if you look at figures like Tojo Hideki uh, in um, World War II, who has a very notorious reputation in America because he was the, the chief of the Japanese government when Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. And Enver Pasha, who is, is, uh, is considered a kind of a pan-Islamic hero um, of the, uh, the Islamic aid region, uh, to the extent that were, the, his name became the most popular name in the Middle East. So Amber Sadat, uh, Egyptian leader's father was a, a big fan of him. And uh, um, there were so many politicians, including uh, Albania's Enver Hoja, their, their parents were a big fan of Enver Pasha. Um, if you look at their strategies, their goals, we see both that they did contribute to some sort of decolonization. And in fact, um, we were very timid um, to express this, but there are, the new scholarship is more clear on this. Um, yet at the same time, they were also pragmatist imperialist in the sense that they used this idealist language to preserve an empire, a project. And I think that maybe the role of these uh, medium powers like Japan and the Ottoman Empire and Turkey, uh, their, their role in international history that um, they, decolonize and recolonize at the same time, or they decolonize, but uh, for imperialist purposes. Um, what do I mean by this is that I'm gonna go very briefly to the end. Is that with the Ottomans, if you think about this, their initial goal was not, they couldn't be anti-imperialist. If you look at their strategies, 1869 onwards, they were trying to preserve an empire in the celebration of the Suez Canal opening. All the guests of the Ottoman Egyptian government were other European monarchies. Uh, in fact, the Ottomans were part of the Congress of Berlin. Um, it, they are in the corner in the back. Um, they signed this uh, colonization of Africa project. In fact, they had territories in Africa. But what does happen even after the Congress of Berlin is that even though Ottomans were part of it, they're also uh, pushed away. So they, the other European powers could actually use Congress of Berlin to expand their territories, but Ottomans were not allowed to do that. In fact, that, that strategy, that racialization of the Ottomans, Japanese, as well as other non-European independent or semi-independent countries like China, 
Thailand made them allies of fully colonized people. And in fact, so the, the it's the European uh, racialization that made them um, allies in that regard. As a result, I think what we see, I'm going to come to the end of it, is that as uh, Ottoman Empire and Japan went through the World War I um, and their struggles, you know, this con contingent event, uh, once they come out of it, uh, you know, some part of their project fails, some part their, their, of their project succeed um, in the sense that after World War I, um, anti-imperialist opinion among Muslim societies are stronger. Uh, Britain wins the war, but will lose the empire. Um, in that context, the, 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 the Turkish nationalists will utilize international law, their uh, some sort of pan-Islamic mobilization in India, and eventually uh, abolish the, the, the treaty that was imposed on Turkey to uh, make a new treaty called the Lausanne Treaty. That's the treaty that actually certifies current Turkish borders. This is the Ottoman international law delegation of the Lausanne Treaty, one of them is the father of the founder of Atlantic Records, uh, Mr. Ertegun, in America. At that point, it's, it's very interesting in terms of their uh, attitudes and behaviors. So once Turkey assures, gets the recognition that unequal treaties are over, their sovereignty is recognized at the Lausanne Treaty, they stopped their um, anti-imperialist vision. So there's a very big difference for countries like Turkey and Persia maybe, and later on even Japan is that they do, they do not offer any remaking of the world order that Professor Getachu talks about African post-colonial nation state. Once they get what they want, they, meet, they try to remake their society as part of some sort of Western European alliance. Um, and they, in fact, they, uh, they stop being anti-imperialist to the extent that uh, during the Cold War in the 50s and 60s, um, because of its alliance with France and NATO, Turkey, voted with France against Algerian War of Independence. Uh, when they changed that uh, position in 1960, um, Turkey changed their position with the United States. Uh, and I even found uh, something very bizarrely personal that the, um, the person who was the president of the Turkish-French Parliamentary Association was the son of the Ottoman cleric who declared holy war against Britain and France in World War One. So even, you know, the son could be a friend of France, even the even though father was declaring holy war. Um, the, the, to sum up, I think we see a similar process in Japanese case too, that they were pushed away um, uh, in, well, uh, pragmatically used Panasianism, but once the war is over and they wanted to join or um, get their national uh, protection from the US, Japan also stops imagining restructuring the world. Do they, did Japan and Turkey contribute decolonization? I think the scholarship after my book shows that yes, they did. Um, and that might disturb some people, but I think the, the book that I showed, uh, Jeremy Yellen's book on the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere clearly shows that despite all the hypocrisy of Japan's um, um, Pan-Asianism, it did eventually um, supported the independence of some of the countries in Southeast Asia, uh, like Thailand, um, Philippines, uh, Indonesia. Um, and there is more detail that they uh, they had their own United Nations, their 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 own Atlantic Charter. And this is my final uh, point: is that what Turkey and Japan did um, in terms of their ideas of decolonization um, is not very different from what. America and Britain did is that they could combine um, very idealistic language of internationalism, new world order, independence, freedom, emancipation with their own imperial and nation state interest. Uh, but in those, in, in their own particular cases, uh, because they were underdogs and they were racialized, um, their strategies eventually contributed to the decolonization of the world. I'm gonna stop here to uh, maybe leave it to the discussion. I think I already went beyond my allotted time. I hope to hear your questions and comments. Thank you. Great, yeah. And yeah, don't worry about the time. We have plenty of time to discuss, you know, all of this. So Stella, don't, don't feel any pressure to cut your presentation short. Okay. Um, I also would like to extend my thanks to Professor Kolsky and to Professor Lou. Thank you for inviting me. Um, a uh, little bit about me. I started working on Pan-Americanism 
um, for my PhD. And then I think I'm I'm here because I edited a volume on Latin America and the global Cold War, uh, which was originally titled Latin America and the Third World. Um, and it is about sort of the connections of Latin Americans, uh, be it cultural, social or political, um, to, to sort of solidarity movements, to the idea of the third world um, and how they relate to decolonization. Um, and what I'd like to sort of address a little bit here is uh, uh, talk about a little bit about anti-imperialism and the so-called decolonization divide we find between Latin America and other parts of the world. So um, maybe some of you know uh, the infamous speech of Hugo Chavez in the UN General Assembly in 2006, where he says, yesterday the devil came here, right here, and it smells of sulfur still today. Now this was of course in reference to US President George W. Bush. Um, but I think this vignette sort of epitomizes the sort of very difficult, often very antagonistic relationship between Latin America and the United States. Um, and at the same time, I think it's also interesting that very few histories are more intertwined than the one between the US and Latin America from the sort of um, American Revolution to the Mexican-American War um, up to the early 2000s, as we can tell by Hugo Chavez. So you might ask yourselves, what does it have to do with anti-colonialism? Uh, my argument here is that from a Latin American perspective, uh, the history of anti-colonialism is actually the history of anti-imperialism and the US has a central place in it as the um, US empire as it is often referred. Now this covers a whole bandwidth of, um, uh, of, of a whole range of what we might call imperial policies from a sort of dollar diplomacy, sort of penetration of US capital and firms to cultural hegemony but also to a much more formal politics of empire. If you look at, for example, Puerto Rico, which to this point is a ter US territory, but Puerto Ricans are sort of um, second-class citizens. Um, if you look at Cuba in the 2030s, uh, which is occupied by the United States uh, during this period, or if you look at the Panama Canal, which up to the 70s was also kind of a, uh, at least the zone was considered a US territory. And the interesting part of that is really that um, I would say that the idea of a concept of a US empire is something US Americans are not often aware or the run of a mill US American are not necessarily aware of simply because it's not necessarily taught um, at schools. Um, you know, how many, how many normal US Americans know um, that Puerto Rico forms part of the US and that they're US citizens? I mean, as we can tell from the hurricane, uh, even, yeah, well, it's not surprising that Trump doesn't know, but, you know, it's not something that, that really is, um, be, is being kind of, is part of uh, the bigger narrative of the United States. Um, there's even a, been a concerted effort, what Daniel Amor call, has called how to hide an empire, right? Uh, the US is very reluctant to accept its imperial past and present. Um, and, and it really tries to hide the fact that some consider it an empire. So uh, when Chavez maligns the United States, it's sort of a part of a nationalist anti-imperialism tradition, um, which is very much a mainstay of Latin American politics throughout the 20th century. And you can see it today. Um, nothing rallies Latin Americans as much as a little bit of anti-Americanism. It's unfortunately true. Um, and it's also kind of explains sort of the, the really push, especially in 20th century, really constrained US power has united Latin Americans in many ways. Now, when we talk about decolonization, we often also talk about the Cold War. And we often connect it with the Cold War. Um, or located within a Cold War framework, um, sort of at the battle of the system between the USSR and the United States. Um, but in the last decade or so, um, new scholars in the new Cold War history, Tanya Harmer or Jill Joseph, have questioned this chronology for Latin America, um, suggesting a sort of a concept of, of an inter-American Cold War that pits socialism versus capitalism, but, but suggests a much longer a chronology uh, that starts with the Mexican Revolution in 1910, um, a sort of revolution that um, introduces social and economic rights, but also the idea of nationalization, constitutionalizes the idea of national, um, nationalization. And um, they say this, this is from the Mexican Revolution up to this day. 
how else can we explain the somewhat irrational US resistance to the regimes in Cuba and Venezuela? So um, the Cold War is not over in Latin America is their argument. And of course, that means that neither anti-imperialism is over in Latin America. Um, and if you look at Puerto Rico, we might ask ourselves, is decolonization complete in the Americas? Um, in the last bit, I would like to talk a little bit about um, sort of how Latin Americans see decolonization um, and how they contributed to debates on decolonization. Now, if we look at the histories of um, the global South more generally, um, we often find that Latin America is conspicuously absent. Of course, this has to do with historical reasons. Most Latin American countries um, achieve independence in the early 19th century, so they're not part of this global wave of decolonization, the 50s and 60s. Um, but also they don't fit into these master narratives of sort of a um, liberation movement, then becoming post-colonial, the connection between African-American rights, civil rights movement and Pan-Africanism. Um, and this is a, a little bit surprising, I would say, because Latin American politicians and thinkers were profoundly influential in defining decolonization or in, in demanding decolonization. And I just would like to highlight three examples. Um, a really strong push to decolonize, decolonize economics. If we think about Raul Prebisch and his idea of central periphery, arguing that there is a sort of that there are different structures for development economies, and therefore there needs to be a different sort of uh, economic system that supports them, or a fairer economic system. Um, they really push to decolonize rights. Um, Latin Americans have always been advocates of, of, of redistributive rights, social rights, economic rights, but also the right to nationalization, which obviously is very much uh, in opposition to sort of Anglo-American ideas of property. And also a decolonization of knowledge. And one example I can mention here is um, the creation of a Cuban news agency, Prensa Latina, in the 60s, sort of a real concerted effort to really push against the, the dominance of um, Western news agencies, such as AP, Reuters, or Agence France Press. Um, and although intellectually they've been really important, I think politically there's always been a sort of uneasy relationship between Latin American political elites and the post-colonial world, because um, geopolitically and culturally they were questioning their place in the world and they didn't quite see them sort of located um, within this border, what was then called the third world. Um, there's historical reasons for that. There's also cultural reasons for that quite often political elites in Latin America, they define themselves as sort of branch of European culture. There's also racial reasons for that, that um, political elites generally tend to be white in Latin America. So, um, and these are very racially stratified societies at the time. And also I think it's important to notice that there's very different ideas of what decolonization means as Chemel has also pointed out. So when in the 1960s, um, the West Indies, the British Caribbean, uh, decolonizes. Is it Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago ask to join the inter-American system? And actually, there's a real concerted push to not let them join the Organization of American States. Um, on the one hand, because there's very national, there's national interest there. Quite a lot of Latin American countries have territorial disputes with some of these um, newly independent um, island states. But also there, there's the argument that they're not really independent, given that they're not republics, that they still continue being members of the Commonwealth and they still have the queen as a head of state. And there's this um, sort of there's this threat or a perceived threat that they could become a sort of fifth column, um, sort of as agents of the crown, as it were, or agents of the US within um, the inter-American system. So quite often when we look at it, I, I, what I find is national interest trumps international solidarity. So unfortunately, it's not very often it's not a very uplifting story, not from a Latin American perspective. Um, but one way we can look at this is maybe um, sort of 
borrowing from Nils German on, on, on his work on the NIEO, the New International Economic Order, to talk about um, unfailures. So even if political projects do not come to pass, there's still important stories to be told. They tell us a lot about the constraints and powers at play at the time in the international system, how uh, players and actors use this for their own purpose. Um, and, and we never know when these ideas might pop up again. Um, so maybe we can think of these more like unfailures, unfinished stories. Thanks. Great, thanks, Stella. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna be kind of uh, playing a supportive role here. I'll be talking about my part of the world, but um, I'm more kind of synthesizing existing literature on what was happening in China in the 20th century. And in a lot of ways, um, there's kind of it very nicely breaks down into two halves. And I think those two halves in a, in a very kind of tidy way correspond to the story that Jamil is telling in his talk and the Stella, and then secondly the story that Stella is telling in the second in her talk. And so I guess this is the story of the 20th century, right? Like the, the pre-war and the post-war. Um, so in Chinese history, um, in the 20th century, there's a very kind of clear divide, of course, uh, 1949 as the communist revolution. Everything before that, it's pretty messy, but there is emerges about 20, 30 years of a political regime known as the Nationalist Party, and they have their own anti-Western politics, right? And then we can talk about the Communist Party or the, you know, the party led by Mao Zedong in the 50s and 60s and 70s. They have their own version of a sort of anti-Western or anti-US politics. Um, and something that popped into my mind listening to Stella is that, you know, she says for her, for her kind of case study is the United States in particular, right? And I think this is, uh, I find that to be true about China in the second half of the 20th century. And I think this kind of is part of the history of, the broader history of, um, just like the international history, right? That um, for the late 19th, the long, the long 19th century, right? It's Britain that is the center that is opposed by all these uh, non-Western parts of the world. And in the second half of the 20th century, it's the United States. And so, but that moving center of course is basically all around the North Atlantic. So there's a lot of ways, um, and I, I guess the, the, the conclusion to kind of give away the punchline is that a lot of these ideologies are quite flexible and can be kind of, can move in a lot of different ways depending on the context. And that's something that, you know, Jamil and Stella already both mentioned, right? So just to give a, just to talk about these two halves one after the other to kind of um, um, sort of share, share like what, what, what the existing literature that's out there. During the 1920s and 1940s, there very much was a sentiment of a sort of pan-Asianism among the nationalist party. Um, there are two books that recently have talked about this that I know of, and there's actually a lot more that are coming out. I know a lot of people are researching this today. Uh, my friend, my friends, Brian Tsui and Maggie Clinton, both have written about the sort of conservative revolution turn, the turn towards the sort of conservative politics during the nationalist movement that very much turned towards a sort of pan-Asian uh, ideology as justification, right? Um, and this could all be dated back to kind of all starts with Japan, right? Jamil's story, which is at the turn of the century, Tokyo becomes sort of this place where a lot of students around Asia converge and study together, not least of which a lot of Chinese students. Um, and those students go in all sorts of different directions. Some are communists, some are anarchists, some are just conservative nationalists, right? And it is, is that kind of, um, but, that, but that begins for a lot of complicated reasons, going with the Russo-Japanese war, for instance, Japan is kind of seen as the idealized non-Western alternative for Chinese thinkers in the first half of the 20th century. Um, but they also, in, in that interaction in Japan, come into contact with Indian students or come into contact with learning about what's going on in South Asia. So Japan is sort of one pivot and South Asia is another, another pivot for, for Chinese thinkers to kind of connect the dots with, the, to try to build a coalition in, in, in their minds, right? Of a sort of resistance to the West, which is at this point probably, probably means Britain, right? Um, famously, they invite Rabindranath Tagore, the first Nobel Prize winner of literature, who was um, Indian, uh, an, an Indian writer. He comes to China in the 1920s and is feted by all the different thinkers in China. There is talk about sort of of uh, the contrast between sort of Western materialism versus Eastern spirituality, which is shared in common by all these um, um, Asian states and Asian societies. And the thing that's kind of emphasized in the literature is that the, these connections were always kind of framed in culturally essentialist terms, right? That they're, they're civilizations 
what connects China, India, and Japan isn't so much the fact that, let's say, they're trading partners or their military, their military uh, rivals, right? It's the fact that they share like Buddhism, for instance, or some sort of thousands year long history. Um, these are very much, um, uh, you know, to use uh, to use the, the, the kind of vocabulary that Jamil brought up and citing uh, Professor Geta to, right? They were not world making, right? In the sense that they were not trying to address the inequalities and problems of the world order. They were just kind of trying to bump up the status of their Asian states, right? Within the unequal world order. Um, uh, so why, why were they anti-Western in the first place, right? They had a complaint against what they viewed as uh, the problems of Western liberalism. And this is striking because at the turn of the 20th century, in China and much of the world, I assume, right, they were, they were very much Europhiles, right? They admired the West, they admired liberalism and democracy and constitutions, right? But then <clears throat> World War I is kind of the turning point, as it is, I think, for a lot of these places, where, you know, Jimbo talked about the sort of unequal treatment in international law. And I think in Chinese history, very famously, the Versailles Treaty, um, is uh, is one instance where the Chinese China is, is mistreated, right? The, the imperial states kind of uh, negotiate over the territories of China without asking China what they think, right? So this is a radicalizing moment, um, and then of course the Great Depression um, kind of uh, disillusions uh, disenchants everyone with capitalism at that point, and so you really have this kind of turn towards you know very famously socialism or barbarism, right? The there is the the turn towards communism, the common turn. Um, and obviously the Chinese Communist Party is connected to the common turn at this point, but the party in power in China, the nationalists, they kind of go in the other direction. They want to tame the excesses of individualism, liberalism, which is associated with free market capitalism, democracy, and so on. Um, they don't wanna stop capitalism, right? They just wanna control it and, and govern it. Um, and this is in the thirties, this kind of newly unearthed history of um, what, you know, we can't really avoid calling it fascism, right, within China. It, it wasn't fallout Italian and, and German style, but there was a tendency um, and, and emulation and adorate or uh, uh, admiration for what was going on in Germany and Italy by the Nationalist Party involving uh, sort of uh, shock troops who were kind of in China, they're known as the blue shirts, not the brown shirts, um, and uh, uh, really shocking episodes of just outright violence against their political enemies to shock or just to, to silence dissent, right? Um, and again, this is always justified on the grounds that, you know, it, it sounds kind of bizarre, right? But Italy and Germany represented an alternative to the West insofar as the West is defined as British free market capitalism, right? So fascism in that sense is, so, so there's two directions, right? Obviously there's a much more radical international direction of the communist direction that eventually succeeds, right, in 1949, but this is the other. So to turn to that other direction is from 1949 to 1970s, there's all these specific moments in which the Chinese Communist Party led by Mao, Mao Zedong is trying to connect itself with what they call, um, you know, the third world or the global south. And a lot of these, I think, adventures kind of overlap with the ones that Stella is talking about, where these are attempts to forge diplomatic ties between governments. China's particular uh, predicament is this, right? Um, after the Communist Party comes to power in 1949, short after is the Korean War, China participates in the Korean War on the side of North Korea. And you know, for historians such as Bruce Cummings, um, who uh, you know, studies Korea and Asia Pacific, he would argue the Korean War more than you know, World War II or more than anything else started the Cold War, right? And in particular, it started the United States policy, NSC 68, right, of containing the spread of communism. And a big plank of that was the United States led the charge to create an international embargo on China. So they've tried to isolate China from the rest of the world. China, of course, is connected to the, to the USSR, but they're not really that close of friends. And that's, the relationship will end within 10 years. And in the meantime, then, the, the, the Chinese government is thinking, all right, you know, crap. Like, the United States is the most powerful country in the world. We've been isolated from them. We need to find friends elsewhere. So this explains the context, the very famous example that people have probably heard of in 1959, the Bandung Conference in Indonesia, where the sort of all the countries of the decolonial or the post-colonial world gather and kind of forge, kind of pledge some sort of allegiance to each other. Part of that strategy was trying to, China was trying to turn a lot of Asian countries to pledge allegiance to them rather than the United States, and they fail, right, on that, on that regard. You can't really blame those countries, right? So that's kind of one episode, right? Um, and then, as I briefly mentioned, the USSR-China relationship fizzles out by 1960, 
And so in the 1960s, China, once again, feeling truly isolated from both the United States and the USSR, once again, try to ramp up their connections to African, Asian, and Latin American countries. Um, and, you know, in the same way, it fails in the sense that nothing really comes out of this, but you had this when you had the, a lot of the strongest rhetoric in, in communist history of talking about how, uh, you know, it was the it was the Western industrial countries that led the first revolutions, you know, the, the French Revolution, the U.S. Revolution, and so on. But now the revolutions will be led in the in the poor, um, non-Western countries: China, Asia, Africa, uh, and Latin America. Right. So there's this really strong civilizational uh, East versus West rhetoric at that point. And then finally, I guess the next stage of this would be um, kind of the one reflecting this kind of no notion of instrumentalization, or perhaps. Um, um, uh, sort of using it to achieve political ends it comes out most clearly in the 1970s where, you know, I think a lot of people um, have probably heard of the very famously Nixon, President Nixon visits China in 1972 and gradually there's a thawing of relations that culminates in 1979, right, where Deng Xiaoping, the, the successor, uh, uh, indirect successor of Mao Zedong visits the United States and Jimmy Carter and so on. Um, and at that point, you have a really interesting transition that a lot of historians are still trying to understand. I think that's kind of the thing that a lot of people are trying to understand now. But for instance, there is one famous anecdote from the leader of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, who would say that, I think there's an interview with Time Magazine, so it's not the most um, um, high, level, high level document. But he, say, he gives an anecdote that Deng Xiaoping visits Singapore in the 70s, and he tells Lee Kuan Yew, quote, I came to Singapore on my way to Marseille in 1920, it was a lousy place, but you have made it a different place. Inspired by all the success of capitalism in Singapore, the Chinese press stops referring to Singapore as a neo-colonial outpost of the United States. Instead, they refer to Singapore as a model city for China to emulate, right? Um, and so, you know, we could talk a lot more about the contemporary world, I'm sure hopefully it comes up in the conversation as well, where China, I think um, very clearly today occupies this ambiguous relationship towards this idea of the anti-West or sort of third world or first world, is it, is it not? So to just kind of jump to the sort of the conclusions there then, I think this history tells us that, again, anti-Western or anti-colonial or third world strategies are very, have been historically um, flexible. And in fact, we see them used by both the pro-communists the pro and the anti-communists, right? So the people who are mortal enemies, right? They both use the same ideas. Um, and a lot of times it is, useful when it's useful for geopolitical or economic ends, um, or, or often it's in reaction to geopolitical dilemmas such as being isolated from the US or isolated from the USSR internationally. And I think, again, this is, the more I was thinking about this, um, you know, reading Stella's kind of questions about does Latin, where does Latin America fit, right, in the international order, I was thinking, well, I've always kind of thought, where does, where does China fit? Maybe China's a special situation. Or where does Japan fit? Is Japan a special situation? Is the one non-white country that industrializes and so on? I don't know. Maybe this is kind of an interesting dilemma to 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 to, to raise for um, you know now that we have the whole world represented, right? Are there any non-special situations, or are the special situations actually the majority of the situations? Or you know, sort of that question of um, when you study one part of the world, you kind of tend to compare it to the rest of the world and say like, well, my place is special, right? But when you kind of do a lot more of these comparisons, I think it gets a lot more complex to kind of, it, it complicates that background where it seems like the rest of the, rest of the world is self-explanatory except for the part you study. But actually um, when you put them in a comparison, it actually, the, these categories of what's Western, anti-Western, what's first world, third world um, gets more complicated. Um, so I'll stop there. I think, I think we've honestly kind of talked about a lot of the same topics. Um, um, so we could, what we could do is, I don't know, if, if you have, Elizabeth, if you want to jump in, or if Jamil or Stella have any uh, things you want to uh, talk about first, or, um, and at the same time, we have, oh, we actually have Q&As. We have a lot of questions, actually. So we could jump to there eventually, but I don't know if we want to first talk amongst ourselves, or if there's any sort of loose ends we want to tie up. Yeah, I'd like to say something about your, your idea of uh, flexible anti-colonialism. Um, I was thinking, yeah, it's, it not, it's not only flexible, it's all, it also defies political categorization. 
because I think the way it is often seen, anti-colonialism is sort of left-wing revolutionary, um, or it's associated with these sort of characteristics. But um, in my case, for example, I looked at Argentina during the Falklands crisis, which is a super repressive authoritarian um, regime, and they still claim anti-colonialism for themselves. Um, and you'd think it doesn't fit together at all, but somehow it, it seems to work for them. I don't know how they do it. You know, you have to be quite schizophrenic about it. But I think the, the really interesting part of this is that you can tap into that. It's a sort of repertoire you can use um, that, that really defies politi political, at the political spectrum. Yeah. I, I have a quick question. I'd love to hear more about, uh, I, I mean, um, this idea of anti-Westernism I mean, I know, Jamil, you talked about, I think you said you'd found your dissertation topic right around, or you're writing your book right around 9-11. And, you know, right around 9-11 in the US American context, there's all this talk about why do they hate us? Um, and so this notion of, it was a kind of, that, that anti-Western, why do they hate us? So I'm just wondering, you know, when you talk about anti-Westernism, what do we mean by that? I mean, yeah. West, where is this West? Is this people? Is this a place? Is this an ideology? Is this, what do we mean? And what are the connections between this 21st century, why do they hate us discourse and this earlier type of anti-Westernism that you're talking about? Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. I, um, I also see some questions, but I, I think this is precisely one of the points uh, that I was trying to make in the book is that there was actually no anti-Westernism. All the critiques of Europe and its imperialism was very universalist, based on the distinction between good Europe, enlightenment, modernity versus bad Europe of racism and imperialism. In fact, the surprise for, for us to study non-European intellectually is intellectual history is that there wasn't there, there should have been more anti-Westernism than there was. I mean, we are surprised at how nice they are. I mean, that's also true for Du Bois. Um, look at all the Pan-Africanists, they are so conciliatory, so polite. I mean, Pan-African um, proclamations of 1900, even 1921, is just saying, you know, can you do something nice about the former German colonies in Africa? Nothing else. But even that is not recognized, right? So there is, the Europe, European intellectual soft power is still very strong. People still believe in shared values that can be Eurocentric. And that's why countries like Turkey and Japan are interesting because uh, their leaders are both very pro-Western, but at certain points could be the ones who are leading this pan-Islamic, pan-Asian campaign. So our misunderstanding usually that actually Japanese themselves promoted that idea is that Japan was pro-Western, the right-wing people came to power in the 30s and they pushed Japan to an anti-Western direction and Pearl Harbor, and afterward, this, again, good people came to power, which is a complete lie. It's the same people who were actually pro-Western decided to be uh, Pan-Asian, and the same is for, true for Turkey. Ataturk, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk was a general in the Pan-Islamic Jihad army in, in Palestine, and uh, they mobilized Pan-Islamism very smartly to kind of create a mobilization in India against the British, scared the British too much, received financial support from Indian Muslims, um, funded their war of independence, and to then force Britain for a compromise that is current borders of uh, Republic of Turkey. So I think that's one point we need to understand that until 1950s and 60s, when there's a crisis of modernity, to say that there are seeds of it earlier, that like Asia and Islamic world could be an alternative to Europe, we actually see a very pro-Western geopolitical thinking in terms of intellectual content, right? That um, there, there's, there's no fundamentalism or, or kind of Islamic radicalism in Muslim societies um, in those times and early times. So the, the young Turks who declared holy war or is pan-Islamic jihad against, the auto, against European powers were very Westernized when they were young Turks. So they're, they're known to be very uh, pro-Western intellectually. And I think that leads to one uh, issue that we are uh, dealing with is that if you think about the 20th century international world history from beginning to the end, 
there are things that we can probably celebrate and be proud that at least colonized people you know can can um, lead their own country they are liberated they have their own independence so from one perspective 20th century was good for them but from another perspective uh, it's an incomplete project I think one of the reasons why there are so many new books on these issues of going back earlier to think about what could have happened or what steps haven't been taken is quite interesting because we want to see that uh, there are lost futures. There were hopes to remake the world. Um, and and as there are some doors that are closed. I think uh, Adam Getachev is clearly working on that. Right? There are so many other people are, are working on these projects. One thing I could see in, in this uh, topics, and, and uh, that's why I think Mark Galicio's book was very important, to look at African-American, Japanese, Indians, Muslims. They were talking to each other, but we, we look back and I wish they talked more, they, they, as if they had more cooperation uh, between each other. It seems their conversations were limited. I mean, Bandung is the first time they actually get together in their own countries before they used to talk to each other in Paris and London and, and Brussels and other places, or in Tokyo and Istanbul uh, partially, um, because these conversations would have empowered each other, kind of lead to a cooperation. Um, so that, that I think one issue that we hope to kind of work more on this is that we hope that there was more a conversation. This leads to also the kind of critique of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and Indians who were great anti-colonialists, but their writings or their uh, discourses on um, Africans were horrible, right? From our contemporary perspective, they still believed in this racial hierarchies. And that's true for uh, Japanese and the Ottomans too, that they had a, a vision of, of civilizing their own region. Um, one uh, issue that I also wanted to note, uh, and I think there are multiple questions, but I have seen one question on Palestine. Um, that after World War I, there's something unique about the Ottoman case is that while they were using this idealistic language to liberate the Islamic world um, from European colonial rule, pragmatically, I mean, they, um, they weren't always saying that. The, the previous version of it is to make an alliance with Britain for the giant cost, joint custody or joint management of the Islamic world. The Britain is the biggest Muslim empire politically, and the Ottomans are spiritual sovereigns. But once the war started, then they became anti-British. But as a result of that, the counter-British strategy was actually then colonize the Arab Middle East, which didn't have any anti-Ottoman feelings. They were very loyal to the Ottomans, including Palestine, um, in the name of self-determination and um, religious tolerance and ethnicity. So it's, Arab Middle East became the last part to be colonized in the world, but it's colonized on behalf of Wilsonianism. I mean, if you think about messy contradictions in terms of idealistic language and the, the horrible realities, Palestine will be a very good example of the Arab Middle East. Right? You colonize a place by making reference to Woodrow Wilson's idea of self-determination. Um, and I think that could also be true for some of the hypocrisies of the, the, the Japanese empire and others. I mean, Japan in 1919 at Paris Peace Conference proposed racial equality, which, could have, which was celebrated by African-Americans and others. But once it was rejected, uh, quid pro quo, now everybody learned that term from Trump's Ukraine uh, thing. Uh, they said, okay, if you're not rejecting, accepting racial equality, give me the former German colonies in China, which is kind of a, the, the which is very important for Chinese-Japanese relationship. I mean, we could see some, some of these also hypocrisies and contradictions in even um, not only in the European dealings with the Middle East and Palestine, but also in Japanese dealings in East Asia. I, I'll stop here. I mean, there are questions, but we, you can decide in which order we need to go to. The yeah, we should, I mean, we should answer some of these and I think uh, I encourage more. I think one question I wanted to throw out also, I think this is the override or the question that's kind of lurking in the background, which is both of you kind of touch on this point that anti-colonialism, anti-Westernism is very often, um, you know, I think Jamil used the word instrumentalized. Uh, Stella used the word that national interest, Trump international interests. But you both do this caveat where like, it's not all bad, right? It's, we can't be completely cynical about it. Stella, I think you were the one who brought up the unfailures. Is that, is that right, right? Um, and Jamil, of course, is just, just now talking about um, the sort of mixed legacy. 
And this is a question, you know, I, I had also posed to uh, Professor Gedichu, which was, um, how do we draw that distinction? Um, is it, uh, yeah, I mean, how do we draw that distinction? Is there a way, is it just like a case by case basis that uh, some, 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 some powers, some movements, some thinkers, right, are just like better people, right, than the other people who use it cynically and for nativist and for sort of harmful reasons? Um, I think that's, a, I don't know the answer to that question. And, uh, you know what, the, I'll say like I, I asked Professor Gedichu, like, is the distinction just between like, an anti-colonialism that is internationalist versus one of those nativist, right? And she said, uh, you know, she said, well, white supremacy is international, right? So that's not necessarily the case that just because you're international, that's necessarily good, right? Mm -hmm. So so I'm still kind of stumped about exactly how you draw that distinction. Um, and I think both of you have kind of pointed out like it's a really mixed historical legacy. Um, and I think, I don't know, maybe this kind of gets to a lot of the questions, but like, for instance, several have just kind of asked, like, for instance, Bryn has asked, that, uh, Bryn Sundberg has asked this, um, um, that, you know, how do we think about it in our current moment? Like, is it is it still a useful, how do we make it useful, right? How do we make sure, and how do we make sure we avoid sort of the, the bad ways decolonial, decolonial language has, or anti-Western or whatever language has gone? Um, yeah, I'll, just, I'll, I'll throw that out there. Um, I don't know if you have any immediate thoughts or we could just kind of go to the some specific questions. Yeah, Stella. Well, I will ask Stella to, uh, I was last uh, yeah. maybe okay. to make a comment and I have some uh, note on this, but I, I will get to it after Stella. Okay, this is a very hard question, but I would answer that. Um, yes, I think they are the ones that are driven by the, the states that are driven by their national interest and they use the international forum. And then they're the, there's the ones who are driven by internationalist um, ideas. Um, and I think about Cuba, which is very, very internationalist, but of course, also in the interest of pushing its own revolutionary agenda. For me, I think I would say, um, generally speaking, I don't see it's bad that you, if you push your nationalist agenda, uh, in a sense of, you know, you have a self-interest um, a national self-interest and I would you say there's it's not per se or wrong in itself um, and I think it quite often um, sort of um, for example Latin American countries or other countries in the global south are a bit sort of maligned that they're sort of only interested in their own sort of um, national interest but I think given that they don't have a lot of resource and not a lot of po political power I think it's also a question about where where do you put this political power and where do you use it? Uh, and in the end, um, if you're Sweden or the Netherlands, maybe you can afford to be sort of unselfish in your international politics, but maybe that is a prerogative um, for sort of countries that have the resources and the political cloud and the, and the money, let's face it. I mean, it's also about, you know, you know can, yeah, can you afford it? Um. Yeah, I think I think I want to combine this question with uh, I, I saw a question on Korea and Japan and also the question on Ottoman international law. Um, it, it does seem that uh, these uh, non-European medium powers who are also uh, sometimes getting stronger, uh, they can have a dual path. Um, they can either kind of replicate what the European empires were doing, or they could, as Sunya San told his Japanese audience in 1924. Uh, speech on, on great Asian unity in Kobe, he said, now that Japan has power, you have two options, right? You can either follow the Western way, Kingu way, or you can follow the moral way. And that, of course, that distinction, this goes to whether you instrumentalize an idea or you follow the idea. Of course, it's never simple. I mean, these are states and countries and they have to pursue their own interests. Uh, but what we see in the long term, though, medium powers like Japan, Turkey, and China, um, they have, uh, and that's the book that I refer to, Stella is a Latin American his colleague, uh, Arnold Becker wrote on mm -hmm. legal internationalism. He says that if you're a very weak country and you're objecting to uh, legal inequality, nobody cares about you. If you're a European country, uh, you actually created legal inequality, you don't wanna change it. And the only country that the countries that get have a power and an interest to uh, eliminate legal inequality and extra, extraterritoriality, uh, unequal treaties are these medium uh, imperial powers. And he uh, 
as an argument that the, the international lawyers of these countries like Ottomans and the Japanese and the Chinese did a lot to universalize international law. We may disagree with them, um, with them on detail, but it is true that the Ottoman Empire actually built uh, international legal office uh, as early as uh, Americans and earlier than many of the European countries because they thought they could defend their empire through international law. But we also see, as we see in, in the case of Japan and Korea, is that the moment Japan gained legal equality, which is 1899, uh, after ironically proving themselves to be very barbaric against Chinese, right? That, that's the Okakura Tenshin's comment. He said, when we were just doing tea ceremonies, we were considered barbarian. But when we butchered people in the battlefields, we were now considered civilized and uh, given legal equality. Then the next step, what they do is that when they get Korea, to colonize Korea, um, and then they look at British rule in Egypt as a model for their colony in Korea, which is very bizarre because at first Japan was looking at Egypt as a model because Egypt was ahead of Japan, but now they were looking at British rule in Egypt. Um, then they make sure that the Koreans do not send uh, legal representatives to uh, the Hague conferences, the, one of the first conferences. Their biggest achievement is actually prevent Korean representation. So you could see how a country that supposedly contributed to racial equality and the universalization of international law can use that power to suffocate um, their neighbor, uh, their neighbor's representation. And I think that kind of um, the dilemma of idealism and pragmatism and interest, state interest is, is replicated, perhaps even the current case of China, right? And once you have that kind of power as China does, what will China do with that power? I mean, it's also a member of the Security Council. And you mentioned this moment where they were all uh, for, um, um, for decolonization of Middle East and Africa. But since 1980, and I studied that from the perspective of the Middle East, since 1980, when Chinese leaders decided that they will always be with America for their interest, uh, Deng Xiaoping's uh, model, China was never on the side of any Middle Eastern country. It's actually very well received and pursued in the Middle East. It's one of the reasons why the kind of Islamic internationalism in the Middle East rose is that they lost all their allies like the Soviet Union and China. And that's something to think about. Um... Yeah, I know that's really interesting. I think, I mean, the just to really briefly comment on how do we understand China today? And, and I think that's one of the reasons that I kind of came up with this or was thinking we should talk about this was because you hear a lot of anti-Western rhetoric to justify policies in China today. And I think that's similar to the way my understanding, right, of a place like South Asia with and, and Erdogan in Turkey, and I'm sure, uh, I don't know, in Latin America, I assume like anti-US, anti, like you can't tell us what to do, you are the imperialist. Is that kind of like a, a sort of like a way to deflect criticism, right? And um, I think that might, maybe, maybe we just decide that is very obviously the cynical mode, right? Of anti-imperialism, anti-Westernism, that there, that there is no like hope of, or there's very little you know, sort of sincerity in there. That's not the unfinished project, right? That is just the sort of cynical veil to justify um, naked pursuit of power and, and economic interest. One thing I was going to point out when I just kind of did a little bit of research on this, just to pr make sure I was correct about this, right? That for instance, China gets a lot of criticism for um, human rights policies, but also like a lot of freak out over like their investment in, in Africa or Pakistan and the Middle East, um, uh, uh, specifically from like U US and European powers, right? At the same time, China is the largest trading partner of the United States. Of the largest, their own largest, their own largest trading powers of the U.S. And, and European Union, and as we also know, like the China by buying U.S. Treasury bonds is keeping the U.S. dollar afloat. So a lot of people pointed out this idea of a U.S.-China Cold War that's coming is not the perfect analogy, right? Because the U.S. and USSR, in theory, were completely separate and kind of battling for the world domination, and whereas China and the United States seem actually quite good at being partners. Uh, at the same time that you have this very heated rhetoric and, and almost sort of like, again, East versus West rhetoric that is emerging. So I think, you know, whatever, uh, so whatever's going on in China today, I think is a very complicated question as far as that goes, but the rhetoric has kind of returned, right? The sort of, you can't, you can't tell us what to do, right? Because we're, we're, we're gonna provide an alternative to you. Um, so maybe we should jump to some of these questions. And I, you know, we should obviously invite people to um, ask more questions in the Q and A. Um, I'll choose, 
um, one from a friend, Selda Altan, who says, um, Professor Aiden talks about Pan-Asianism and Pan-Islamism in the Ottoman and Japanese empires as continuous national policies, whereas both in Japan and Turkey, post-war regimes were founded by people with different outlooks. You kind of addressed this already earlier, right? Um, how accurate is it to say that once Turkey gained its sovereignty, it gave up its anti-Western discourse? Um, as I point out, uh, apparently there are alternative interpretations of pan-Islamism and pan-Asianism, right? How would these alternative or competing positions fit into your narrative? So I guess the big, big question is like, what happens to anti-Western discourse with the founding of modern Turkey? Yes, um, and, and also to Jap modern Japan too. Um, yeah. it, it does seem that um, all the way until the Lausanne Treaty, for example, Turkey kept the option of a Turkey-Arab Federation. Um, so that was, because the Arab world was, was cut out of Turkey after World War I, uh, while they were doing this big pan-Islamic campaign um, around Amir Pasha, there was a revival of a pan-Islamic mobilization uh, tied to the failure of Wilsonianism and the League of Nations. In fact, the uh, kind of pan-Islamism peaks uh, at the moment of Wilson and Lenin's popularity. And Amir Pasha uses that fear of Muslim revolt. Uh, he moves around, he makes alliances with the Bolshevik, but his very success obviously helps Turkish nationalists. And then they were all killed or eliminated and Turkey makes a deal. And, and I think uh, uh, Sada Altan's question is very wise. Like why did Turkey suddenly change course? Um, and it seems part of it is, is, is the deal with the British involves signing a treaty that says that I renounce all legal claims on territories, former Ottoman territories in the Arab world. Um, and in addition to that, they, um, they are aware that Turkey is only 8 million, Indian Muslims are 80 million. And they make this, this calculation is that, you know, what happens if you keep this kind of leadership among the Muslim masses, if Indian Muslims ask our help, how are we gonna help them? It's, it seems they, they kind of wanted to, wanted, to have, wanted to have that security and safety of joining the international order, Eurocentric international order. They may also, I mean, they were also the most hated Muslims, so they're, they're called the terrible Turk, and they were, they needed to change that image um, clearly. I I will say in, in the Japanese case, for example, I, 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 I I do still believe that the race mattered in interwar period in the 20s and 30s. Not everything was just pragmatic, right? Why did Japan went all the way to declaring war on Britain and, and America and the Philippines at the same time? And it's a very contradictory moment, but some people say it was just a cover up for their colonialism in China. Uh, but if you look at diplomats' di diaries and biographies, they were really shaken by this anti-Japanese um, racial exclusion laws in the United States. It's very symbolic. They moved, they banned Japanese immigration, even though Japan limited it to only 500 people a year. I mean, it's nothing compared to what could have happened. In 1924, it was psychologically uh, very important. So you could see that I think the whole identity perception and uh, the interest of the empire might intersect at some point. It's hard to separate the two. Um, so we have a question for Stella, and I also want to throw my own, my own question on there. Um, so first questions are from our colleague, Christina Soriano. She says, it seems that Latin America went through a relatively late process of decolonization with the, raise, uh, the rise of the pink tide with Chavez, Evo, and Lula, who led a reaction against 1990s neoliberalism. But what about social movements and ideologies that came long before in the early and mid 20th centuries, such as the Mexican Revolution, Sandino, and Cuba? Were those failed attempts of decolonization with the end of the Cold War? Can we talk about different ways of decolonization? And my own question, which is separate, but I thought, you know, I was curious about this to hear what you thought about this. In reading about um, China and the Cold War, uh, there was a lot of talk about you know, Asia, Africa, but also Latin America as, uh, at least in like the, the rhetoric of the Communist Party. And then there's always this kind of uh, people just, uh, there's this new research actually on the sort of global history of Maoism that Maoist thought influenced a lot of people outside of China, especially in that 60s and 70s moment. But I'm just out of personal ignorance. I don't actually know the, the, the degree that there was some sort of uh, mutual influence or sort of admiration from one side to the other between Latin America and, and China in the 60s and 70s. Was it actually uh, 
um, a thing. I think I've read about like a delegation from Latin America visiting China at one point, but um, was it just purely superficial or was there actually like a deep kind of um, interest in, in Chinese politics or vice versa, Chinese politics being interested in Latin America during this period? Um, yes, actually, interesting enough, Maoism is, I don't want to, I wouldn't say it's quite influential, but there's definitely some influence. And it's mainly on the Pacific, Pacific side of Latin America, particularly in Peru, um, where, um, for example, where there's quite a bit of um, Asian um, immigration, uh, probably connected to that, or maybe not. I mean, I don't know. I, mean, I think Peru, because it has, in the 30s, it has a very leftist government that is kind of um, very indigenous um, and it sort of really connects um, with, with some of the ideology. Um, I think communist parties, they're, very, they're quite influential in Latin America, um, but they're very much modeled um, after the European models kind of, you know, Euro communism in the 70s, 60s and 70s is sort of very influential in Latin America. So it's always the sort of, I would say, the more moderate communism and socialism that is uh, more prevalent. I hope that answers your question. Um, on the question of sort of decolonizations in Latin America, um, I think, yeah, I think um, Joseph, Joseph calls the 20th century the century of revolution in Latin America, and I think that's correct. It's like one revolution after another. And it's not just political revolutions, it's also social revolutions, it's um, economic revolutions with agrarian reform. Um, but in some ways, it's also sort of cultural revolutions as certain former minorities or ethnic or racial minorities um, sort of are incorporated into the, the idea of the nation state. Um, and I think what I'm particularly interested in is the sort of idea of economic decolonization. Um, the idea that there cannot be uh, true sovereignty without economic sovereignty, sort of the idea of Kwame Krumah's sort of neocolonialism, right? It's just a different form of colonialism if you are not, um, if you cannot sort of use your own resources and are sort of economically stable and independent. Um, and I think there's also a history there you can trace of different sort of attempts to decolonize e economically from the 1930s with input substitution to the 1950s and 60s um, to really find a way to change the economic world system um, to the then obviously that fails then you have the neoliberal sort of um, debt policies of the United States and then there's a push against with the pink tide to say yeah this has really devastated it has really increased inequality in Latin America uh, and now we're looking for a different way to sort of claim this economic sovereignty. And it is an ongoing fight. So in that sense, yes, decolonization is not complete in Latin America. Um, so we have another question. This is from Peli Bagbonan. Uh, sorry. Uh, this says, do you see any emerging nations or imperialistic powers that need to be addressed in the near immediate future, i.e. China's influence on the African continent or US influence in the Middle East? Um, that's an open-ended question. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just take the China question again, just to briefly mention this. There is a recent study by C.K. Lee, a sociologist, um, who I think is one of the first to actually just do like intensive field work um, on a Chinese investment mining company, um, uh, and I think in Zambia, um, to get at this question of this fear of China in Africa, right? And it's just, as you point out in the introduction, these fears of China and Africa began in like 2010, 2011. And statistically, like the investment of China in Africa was a fraction, right, compared to European and US investment. So I think her basic point was that this was kind of an overreaction by the US and European press, uh, perhaps as a sort of reflection of their own insecurity, that they were kind of losing onto their own sort of um, post-colonial empire, imperial holdings overseas. Now that number, I think I looked it up recently, it actually is quite close at this point. Like I think China might actually be the number one investor in a lot of these African countries. So it wasn't completely their imagination, right? But I think, um, but but, in, but part again, part of the justification for the Chinese state would be something like uh, that they, that, I mean, I've, I've seen, I've, I've read like they've, they would say, they would tell 
It, it is a, I don't know who's exactly saying this, but it's a topic for discussion that unlike the European powers who colonized Africa, China will do it, uh, will, will do it in a better way, right? They will not be as exploitative. They will not be as, um, you know, they, they will not, uh, they will not put you know, African countries into debt uh, as much as the European powers did and so on. And I think, you know, the foundation, the founding belief there, I guess this is another point that it was kind of worth noting that the foundational belief there isn't some sort of civilizational connection, but it is those efforts in the 50s and the 60s, that sort of very leftist moment in the 50s and 60s, third worldist moment, where there was an established history that was created between China and Southeast Asia and Africa and the Middle East, that ironically is now being kind of tapped and leveraged, right? To, to justify things like, people have probably heard of the Belt and the Road Initiative or the One Belt, One Road Initiative that ostensibly would connect like China to Nairobi, to Germany and back, right? Like to, to, to create a sort of alternative global globalization. And uh, it's very, I don't think there's any doubt that it's a sort of like pro-development, pro, development, pro modernization kind of project, but um, the justification for it or the sort of part of the rhetoric is like thinking back to those relationships that are created during the Maoist period, right? When it was very much about anti-imperialism. So there's, I think just like another another instance of the sort of flexibility of these, um, or the flexibility, or I guess the open-endedness of these connections, because they can always say like, we are not Western countries, but right? that, that's still true. And right? that's not false, right? They were not Western countries, right? But the context and the content of that anti-Western politics um, or anti-European politics or whatever you want to call it, um, does seem to does seem to shift around, right? With 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 the different periods we were we we're living through. Um, well, one thing, maybe yeah. Andrew, I, I wanted to note briefly is that uh, we are in a moment now where we know that the international order or the world order, economically, politically, built after World War II or in the 20th century. We know that it's defective, it's not working. It's, it's horrible for some regions, like Middle East is just burning. And it's actually the making of the US hegemony in that region or, or but we have no um, intellectual idealistic alternative. I mean, Europe and America, they just do small fixes and bomb places from there and then withdraw, watch and go, they go and bomb more people and withdraw. And they also don't let other people do anything. Yeah. And so it, it seems like in the absence of any kind of idealistic visions, um, then people are also like unnecessarily worry about China, Russia, but you know, they, they're also not offering any, any idealistic vision. There's only offering some sort of vague balance yeah. of power thing. It's not only one, but there is definitely a serious crisis. I think the, the reason why there is so much interest in the history of decolonization is to also try to understand like how we get here, what, yeah, where we where, where we made the mistakes? Like, why is it this economic equality is something that people completely abandon now? Right. I mean, there was so these in OPEC times. The early OPEC was trying to use oil to to close the gap with uh, with the developed world, uh, and now oil prices is only in the market fluctuations. I mean, nobody believes that oil wealth is going to be good for anything. In fact, it's seen as a curse. I, I think we are in a bigger crisis. So history is some sort of one way of thinking about the roots of this crisis, but I don't see much of a hope in anywhere. I mean, that's one of the reasons um, why it's very depressing to study international affairs and world order to it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, is that something that both of you um, thought about? Like, why are you interested in this very much more idealistic and um, optimistic moments uh, in the, let's say the, the middle third of the 20th century um, as a sort of, is, is the premise always sort of like, and this is gonna end <laughs> when neoliberalism happens, or this is gonna end with uh, the sort of clamping down of the cold war and the end of the USSR that kind of always offered a sort of, at least sort of force of resistance, right? To the United States. Um, is, does that sort of hang over cold war history or let's say most of 20th century history? Um, I, I would say the interesting part, when I started writing my PhD on US-Latin American relation, it was kind of the uh, sort of end of the pink tide and, and Brazil was growing like crazy and we were talking about BRICS and the new regional powers. Yeah. Uh, and I really thought like, this is the moment, maybe finally Latin America has managed it. You know, they were dem democratizing, you know, human rights were improving. Um, you know, dictatorships were behind them. Mm 
And then when I finished writing, <coughs> that short sort of a window of hope had sort of closed again and you felt like, whoa. Um, that was short um, and it's sort of, um, and if we look at it now, I find it very profoundly sad and frustrating if we look at sort of human rights situation in Mexico, um, in some ways there's more, um, yeah, I mean, so many people are being disappeared more than in, in, in the military dictatorships, you wonder what's going on. Um, so sometimes it's just this junction, you think this is really gonna take off and then it didn't happen. So yeah. that, that was that for me. Yeah. I, I mean, I think um, I will say I, I am a, a person who uh, my, my high school, my college coincided with the Gulf War, Bosnian genocide. Um, so we are at that generation of at least in the Middle East, nothing seemed to be working, right? That And there are limits to solidarity, the international solidarity that uh, that probably worked best in, in the case of support for the Bosnia in that region. But since then, um, there are limits to international solidarity. It's not working. The international order is not responding to the crisis. Um, uh, there is some sort of a search for um, an alternative path. At the same time, I also wrote, I, should, I always tell this, but I, it is true that I wrote the book in an office across Sam Huntington's office. So I was also kind of hating his argument and uh, <laughs> trying to understand why everybody got attracted to that idea. So this is actually an anti-clash of civilization um, text that I was trying to write against them. And, and I mean, just to, to put the Ottoman Islam, pan Islamism and Japan's pan Islamism together was I thought was some sort of a strategy to show that this has nothing to do with religion or culture, that these are, um, grand ideas which are universalistic, anti-racist, globalist, which you know was used by these empires, but they have a life beyond those empires. Uh, Pan-Africanism, Pan-Asianism, Pan-Islamism are still there. The only um, big difference, which I like a lot, like when I was working on Pan-Asianism in Japan in late 1990s and early 2000s, Japanese would always say, you know, Asian solidarity is a great thing. We should be united. But with the assumption that they will be the big brother. Right, yeah. And that disappeared. Now, if you say there should be an Asian solidarity, the assumption is that China will be the yeah. big brother. And actually Koreans is a cultural, uh, culturally better than others. And they can say culturally, we are the big brother. As I really like that transformation at least within East Asia that uh, Asian solidarity is not a monopoly over uh, that the Japanese had in, in the past. Yeah. I wonder, I'm really, I'm really taking what you say about in this 21st century moment, because if you think about it, we're more interconnected than ever before. I mean, the internet, social media allows, I mean, when you're talking about transnational solidarities in the early 20th century, it was much more difficult. Technology didn't allow for communications across, you know, even within nations, forget across national boundaries, right? In terms of the time it sent to, you know, the time it would take to send a letter or to travel. But I wonder, you know, in terms of what we saw in the past year with the internationalization of the Black Lives Matter movement following the murder of George Floyd, yeah. if there is a resurgence, if this, I mean, I feel like there is this kind of resurging moment of international solidarities, toppling of statues around the world, you know, the whole world in <laughs> different ways, varied ways, Australia, United States, Britain, uh, you know, reckoning with these legacies of inequality, racism, violence, so I wonder if it's kind of, you know, as historians, we look back and we see things that are we, I mean, are we in the moment when nothing is happening? Or are we actually in a moment when something is happening? I, um, I'm sorry, Stella, maybe you have other things. I just want to, before I forget, I, I just say my pessimism uh, focuses on India. So in the period that I worked on, um, India was the most important place in the world. Like all international affairs was in India, right? Before partition, yeah. it's bigger than China. Right. It has this, it's connected to the Middle East, it's connected to East Asia. India is the future, like the people are so excited. And But with partition and what happened afterwards, we get to this moment of Modi. And I think there was one question about like, what is the new great power that we should be worried about? I guess India is one of them. It's just so tragic how, you know, this post-colonial India get to be identified with the Hindu fundamentalism in some ways and depriving its own um, citizens of citizenship because of their religion. And 
Yeah. So that 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 is one pessimistic, but you can also see the optimist version that there's a sense of solidarity in this kind of anti-citizenship act uh, that goes beyond any religion, any class. So there, you can look at both sides of, of this equilibrium. Just really quickly plugging, we'll be talking about that next week for our last talk with this. what's going on with um, India and the sort of Kashmir and the Muslim question in India. But I'm sorry, Stella, if you have any thoughts. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, um, is that the moment? I guess I would say I'm a historian. I don't know. Ask me in 10 years. I mean, I think <laughs> it's very hard to say because you live in the moment and you don't understand all these interconnections. Um, and, and, and yes, there, there are solidarity movements. But if I think about Corona or COVID-19 and everything that's happening with the vaccines, and I'm actually, oh, my God, this is the return of the, of the nationalist agenda. Like, we don't share... Uh, like we don't share our big scene with others because we want to get vaccinated first. Um, so it's it's mixed. It's very hard to say. We we don't we yeah in, in Europe where we where I'm at right we don't know what's going to happen. There's Brexit. Like, is it going to be the resurgence of the European Union? Maybe. Um, will something else come up? I really. Note, you can join us on April 14th. We have Jayati Ghosh, the feminist yeah. development economist who wrote, who's talked about vaccine apartheid. And we're going to be talking about all those issues around sort of vaccines and vaccinations and sort of past and present histories of health inequality and, and all of that. Yeah. Um, we're very conscious here at the LePage Center about time and timeliness. So it looks to me like it is 730. So it is time to say good night. And to thank all of our just superb panelists for joining us tonight. Thank you, everybody in the audience. Again, remind you all that this is an ongoing series of conversations. You can jump in at any time, right? It's, you know, it's, we're, we're building and, and we, we welcome you to join us. We're, we're, we're next week with uh, Andy Liu in conversation with Natasha Call, who's gonna be looking at the issue of the Indian state's treatment of Kashmir and comparing it with sort of Chinese policies toward the Uyghur Autonomous Region. So we hope you'll join us next week, Wednesday at 12.30. Um, and again, we, we, we thank you all for coming tonight. Andy? Yeah, and obviously I think so Professor Krepp and I didn't for participation and wonderful thoughts. And um, it's given me a lot to think about. Uh, I don't know if, at the very least one person, uh, but I'm sure actually everyone. <laughs> Thank you for organizing this series. I, I watched the last week's and I will join next week as well. Thanks a lot. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, Stella, you have to go to bed right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good night.